I would like to welcome you to today's event. Um, it's really delightful to see you all here today. Uh, just a few words about our location. So there are restrooms for women and for men on either side of the amphitheater, and there's an accessible restroom available by third floor on the east side of the building. Um, this is an event in three parts. It's uh, somewhat provocatively titled, It's Time to Rethink Graduate Education. In the first part, I would like to uh, motivate uh, this work and its aims. And then in the second part, we'll have plenty of time, you know, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes for us as a group to have questions, answers, discussion uh, around these issues that I will try to raise for you today. And then afterwards, uh, we're gonna uh, reconvene to the other side of the, of the fourth floor where we'll be able to see some posters uh, put together uh, by, kindly put together by our colleagues, uh, both from across the university and here at Rackham. And we'll also have uh, time for some refreshments and, and additional conversation. So I'd like to begin today by asking you to imagine uh, two members of the Rackham community, uh, a student and a faculty member. Uh, this student uh, has seen the highs and lows of graduate education, you know, the, the pleasure of, of the discoveries that are part of the dissertation, the joy of having a deep relationship uh, with a faculty member, but at the same time has talked about some frustrations and difficulties. For example, being put so on the back foot by the results or the experience of a qualifying examination uh, that this student described uh, that research and scholarship progress really ground to a halt for three months after that qualifying exam while the student processed uh, and recovered from that experience. The same student uh, we are, we're imagining later on uh, in, that, uh, in, in the dissertation process was interested in learning a technique from another faculty member uh, down the hall and uh, wanted to spend just a short period of time in that, that member's lab to try to learn that technique which wasn't available uh, in their own research group. But finding that, making those connections and the way, the way to do that uh, being a really difficult uh, a challenge and, and, and impossible in that case. The faculty member tells a really interestingly a complimentary story. Uh, the, they talk as well about the highs and lows, about the experience of the discoveries that lead to peer-reviewed publication, um, about the, the pleasure of seeing students uh, develop skills, make discoveries, uh, gain the experience needed to go on to make discoveries out uh, in, on their career paths, but also talks about some frustrations and difficulties, such as, for example, feeling so very unprepared uh, to help a student that was interested in a, in a career outside the academy, since that faculty member had spent uh, their own career, their whole career uh, inside uh, the university, and just feeling un, un feeling unprepared or it was difficult to, to make those kinds of connections and be helpful to the student. And in another instance, in working with a student over a long period of time, seeing that student come in to a meeting, uh, a research meeting, and um, having that student present so diff differently at that moment, act so differently that the faculty member knew that that student that they needed to, that, that, the, that um, the faculty member needed to accompany that student to CAPS that, that, even, that, that day. But then when the student returned, being deeply unclear uh, and uncertain about how to go about helping that student with those challenges and wh while making academic progress toward the degree. So I've asked you to, um, I've asked you to imagine these two students, um, but these two students are actually me. And so this is, uh, the st story as a student is me in 1991. Take a quick look because this is the one and only time you'll see this picture. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, that was my story as a graduate student, and also the story of the faculty member is my story as a faculty member here at the University of Michigan. And I mentioned those two stories uh, for, for a few reasons. One of them is that it represents my own personal understanding of some of the work and the aims that I'd like to speak to you about today. But I also think it's interesting because I think I'm probably not the only one that could tell a story of that kind who's here today. I think with the proper translation from my discipline to your discipline, I think these stories represent something that is quite common uh, across the academy. And in fact, these stories describe both the strengths of the model of graduate education that we use here at Rackham and the University of Michigan, but also some of the pressures that are facing it. 
you know, if you think about it, our model of graduate education at its core relies on a deep intellectual connection between the faculty member and the student. It's often called the apprenticeship model of graduate education, and it's been tremendously successful. It's more than a century old. We have some images here that, that, that show that. And it rose as an adaptation of German research universities. Under President Angel, Michigan led the way as the doctorate became the leading signifier of academic excellence. The quality of graduate programs became a key indicator, a char characteristic determining institutional reputation. And Michigan and other universities produced just this unprecedented burst of creativity, research discoveries, and new understandings about people and society. Now, this model of graduate education drew then and continues to draw both students and faculty from around the world to come here to join us. I think despite the many contributions of this model um, that it's inspired both in the past and even today, we know that today there are current pressures that are building up in it, uh, that have been building up in it over time. These pressures, um, we at Rackham have spent the last year thinking about them, um, and indeed I think we lead the national conversation about this future of, of research-based graduate education, both masters and doctoral. We've de developed this understanding through conversations with you as faculty and students and staff. It's been informed by our own data and surveys we conduct to understand the experiences uh, in graduate school. It's been informed as well by the national conversation, by National Academies reports, by foundation reports, also by discussion with our peers in the Big Ten and the AAU. So I'd like to highlight just a few of the most pressing dynamics that I think should inform our vision of the future. I think perhaps the most important pressure is that there's a mismatch between the idea of this apprenticeship model and what our students are actually doing with their degrees. Our data show that more than half of Michigan doctoral recipients pursue careers that are not on the tenure track. This, to me, represents a tremendous source of success. The skills and understanding that our students are, are, are developing can contribute in a variety of sectors, in the private sector, in nonprofits, in government service, and indeed in academia. So these, um, this, is, this is really a strength, but at the same time, these career pathway stats have complex explanations. It's true that the number of PhDs produced each year outpaces the number of available academic positions in some fields. And furthermore, I think it's fair to say that attaining an academic position has become extremely competitive in nearly all fields. I think there's another dimension, however, to consider as well, which is that many of our students already arrive here intending to seek careers outside the academy. Of course, they come here to perform excellent research and scholarship with faculty, but their desired career paths are not in academia. And even in cases where they are seeking roles in a university setting, students might well be drawn to roles that are different than the ones that we ourselves as faculty hold. These might be positions of primarily undergraduate institutions or other professional roles at the university. So I think in this way, the literal idea of an apprenticeship model as one in which the apprentice assumes the role of the teacher and mentor is under increasing pressure here at the University of Michigan. I think there are other pressures, a number of which are outlined here in, in the headlines. Master's training has struggled to keep up with the changing needs of society and to develop new programs in emerging fields as well as accommodate the growing number of students who want to seek research-based master's degrees. We can really ask the question, do we have the educational methods and systems that can keep up with the pace of change of master's education? There is increased public skepticism about the benefits of evidence-based research. There are growing concerns about the affordability of graduate education. There are reports about challenges around the mental health of graduate students that have been appearing with increasing frequency in the national and trade press. And in fact, some of our own data here at the University of Michigan find instances of depression and anxiety presenting at a very high rate among graduate students. And finally, there are rare but unacceptable instances of misuse or abuse of the faculty-student relationship that is really central and core to this model. So those are pressures, but I believe that we have an opportunity here at the University of Michigan. Given our scope as a world-class research institution, um, as well as our position of leadership in graduate education on the national level, I think that we can respond to these pressures by seeking to transform the model of graduate education. So why do I think we have this opportunity? I think first and foremost, most importantly, society has never had a greater need for the advanced training represented by research-based graduate education, for the evidence-based science, for expertise that cuts across multiple areas, 
for thinking from the social sciences and the humanities that can address deep societal problems and for the understanding that helps us communicate across difference. How will we address the complex societal problems now in 2020, in 2030, in 2050 without the deep advanced training that we provide our students that we mentor and train? So second, I think the University of Michigan itself is a unique place to undertake this work. We understand the nature of the pressures we are facing. We have good data that identify them, and we know that you are aware of them because we are hearing about them from you. And third, I think the other question to answer, the other opportunity is, why do this now? I think the reason for this is that right at this moment here at Michigan, many efforts are already underway to think and innovate around these pressures. I think you would be surprised by how widespread these efforts are across campus. In fact, one of our purposes of this today's event is to identify for you the extent to which these efforts are already nascent on campus. In fact, I think when you look at them as a whole, you can realize that this, there's a kind of movement that is already underway. What we want to do here today and going forward in Rackham is coordinate that movement and give it shape. We need something to connect and support these efforts so that they can be amplified in a way that can benefit all students in Rackham and all programs in Rackham. We see our role at Rackham as supporting this movement. It's consistent with our mission, which is to support the graduate student experience and the discoveries of our students. It's consistent with our values of intellectual exchange, innovation, and evidence-based practices. So to respond to those pressures and seize this opportunity, I think it's time to leverage our collective strength. In fact, indeed, it's time to rethink graduate education. So in rethinking graduate education in this way, we have three beliefs. The first is that graduate education should be student-centered. So what I mean by this is that students' own scholarly and research interests, their needs for academic and professional development, and their career aspirations are increasingly incorporated into curriculum and training. Of course, the idea of student-centered graduate education is already implicit in the old apprenticeship model. But at the same time, I think student-centered means something more. The key point is that students have the space for their own aspirations to be incorporated into their curriculum and their educational goals as they work with faculty. I think placing students at the center in this way recognizes the changing circumstances and challenges that our students face in pursuing their scholarly interests and their career pathways. Second, I think this innovation to support the graduate academic enterprise should be faculty-led. Emphasizing the importance of faculty leadership recognizes the disciplinary diversity of our campus, the fact that curriculum is best tailored to the specific needs of students by the faculty members who create, work, innovate, and collaborate with students in those fields. And finally, third, I think this work should be Rackham supported. This support uh, is so that faculty can have the assistance and partnership to develop ideas and move them forward. This is indeed Rackham's mission, and one that we pursue collaboratively around the university. We know, that our we know that for faculty members who are stretched in so many ways in their roles at the current moment, finding the time for these efforts is difficult, even though that this is work that we know that you want to do. That's why Rackham will commit resources to help. The resources are our staff expertise, our research-based data and understanding, our cross-campus connectivity, and our funding. We're optimistic by, the, by reimagining the graduate academic experience as student-centered, faculty-led, and Rackham-supported, Michigan can generate real change that will help us recruit the best students, increase their accomplishments within graduate programs, and send the, launch them into sectors of society so as to generate new discoveries and understanding. So what I would like to do in the next moment is just briefly highlight a few programs across Michigan and here at Rackham that are responding to these changing conditions of graduate education that I've identified. I want to invite you to hear from your colleagues and to see their posters about these initiatives during our reception that will follow uh, the discussion that we have. So the first example I would like to offer is to consider a faculty-led collaboration that is bringing together teams of students from environmental engineering and the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning to collaborate on the technical and societal challenges of planning, building, and managing wastewater and stormwater systems in urban environments. Through this experience, students realize how their own discipline uses specific terminology, how it identifies problems, and proposes solutions. These experiences, uh, they learn how these experiences are different from other disciplines, and they learn how to navigate those differences. At the same time, they also learn the importance of managing both their own expectations and that of collaborators as they engage in this kind of 
experiential work. I think this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, this educational uh, opportunity uh, leverages one of the tremendous benefits of the University of Michigan. It combines, it kind of integrates our strength in physical, biological sciences and engineering with our strengths in social sciences and humanities. I think faculty love to have these interactions and graduate students are asking for them. This is exactly the kind of uh, innovation that uh, can, can meet this, these, what students are asking for as part of their education. As another example, in the Ford School, teams of public policy master students are participating in what's called the strategic policy, pub excuse me, strategic public policy consulting course. In the course, they apply classroom knowledge to work on projects with partners in real world settings, as well as gain new skills and experiences that employers value. So this kind of work has included collaborations with the city of Ann Arbor, the Washington Intermediate School District, and the Downtown Detroit Partnership. And the Ford School has recently opened up this course to graduate students and other UM professional programs. And here as well I see a tremendous opportunity, which is to connect research-based degree students, doctoral students, research-based master students with professional schools. Both of these communities have something to learn from each other. And I would see that this is, uh, the Ford's program is, is, a, is an example of that. And you'll see another poster by the law school as well um, that is another example. As a third example, um, I would like to talk about the Department of Comparative Literature, which has launched three related initiatives to help students integrate professional interests and activities into their academic program of study. They've introduced a graduate certificate in critical translation studies to explore translation in part as a vital skill for professional development. They took over editorial leadership of an international journal dedicated to liter literary translation that is edited by uh, graduate students and supervised by UM faculty. And they're also piloting a departmental program that offers a stipend for working in a part-time internship in one semester. Again, here as well, I think this in initiative represents a way in which um, additional experiential um, our experiences are integrated with deep disciplinary training in a way that will allow all students, no matter what sector is of interest uh, to them, to pr pursue their career aspirations. As a final example, uh, I would like to talk about the Neuroscience Graduate Program, which in collaboration with CRLT players, and this is two players that you've seen um, acting here, um, they recently implemented a new workshop uh, that implements uh, a requirement that faculty and doctoral students undergo directed training to address issues related to gender harassment. They learn how to recognize gender harassment, how to change behaviors related to it, and how to intervene in instances in which it occurs. Rackham was so interested in what neuroscience had put together for this that we learned from it. And in fact, we have our own pilot that is running this year in which four uh, programs uh, across the different divisions of Rackham um, are engaging in a similar activity in which graduate students uh, in, in, in collaboration with faculty learn about gender harassment and how they themselves can contribute to climate within their programs. So I'd like to thank our campus colleagues who have worked on these initiatives and on the posters presenting them that will be, they'll be presenting across the hall. In addition, I'd also like to take this chance to thank colleagues in the Department of History, the Department of Climate and Space Sciences and Engineering, uh, the Graham Sustainability Institute, and the Law School, whose innovations are likewise represented as part of our poster session. I encourage you to speak and learn from those individuals as part of the reception that follows. So now I would like to take a moment to highlight two current Rackham efforts within this space. The first is uh, Rackham's long-standing interest in making internships experience, experiences available to graduate students across campus, and also to a variety, offer a variety of models that meet the needs of students and programs because the academic experience varies across the academy. So as a, in an early phase with support from the Mellon Foundation, Rackham funded internships for professional development in the humanities and the social sciences. Rackham works with partner organizations, for example, museums, community foundations, and nonprofits to create inter intellectually interesting and rigorous and mutually beneficial projects where the organization value the contributions of these graduate students as they participate in during internships. Starting this year, Rackham is extending support for students uh, doing these internships into the biological sciences. And we're also experimenting with ideas about offering them during the academic term so that these opportunities can be regularly available and incorporated into the flow of, this, of the curriculum and the academic progress of students. I think we think these internships can be particularly valuable to individuals seeking a PhD in the biosciences because in those fields, there's a broad range of careers available 
but graduation rates outpace the growth of tenure track positions. As a second example, I'd like to mention the, our diversity, equity, and inclusion certificate. We've heard from all sectors, academia, industry, nonprofits, about the value of, of, our, of training, fluency, uh, experience in the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've created a certificate here at Rackham that responds to those national trends and those institutional needs. We've developed a co curriculum that operates along a number of tracks in which students, graduate students, and, and, and postdoctoral fellows can explore DEI. This has been a really uh, tremendously uh, uh, successful and very popular program. To date, 314 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows from 17 schools and colleges have rolled in the program, and 108 have completed the certificate. And this is a program that's just beginning its third year. So again, this is another example, I think, in which uh, we see that um, in addition to the deep disciplinary training that is offered uh, to our students, there's this additional interest for complementary co-educational activities of a variety of kinds that augment the experience of students. I also want to thank, uh, as well, all the Rackham staff members who have worked on these and numerous other Rackham programs. You can learn about more of them as well as the poster session that will follow. So as, uh, in the last few minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about our strategic vision for graduate education. The initiatives I've touched on here illustrate the type of innovation, innovation that I think that is core to this vision. Of course, achieving a vision like this takes planning, especially in a complex decentralized, decentralized place like the University of Michigan. That vision takes planning, and I want to assure you that Rackham has a plan. I want to share those goals with you now. These goals were developed in collaboration in the last year with more than 100 uh, faculty uh, graduate uh, chairs and directors of graduate programs, with the Rackham staff, with Rackham student government, and with alumni as well. So I really want to thank all the individuals that have contributed to this plan that already at this, at this point is a collaborative and collective effort. Its first goal is very much what we've talked about here today, a reimagined academic experience. In this goal, faculty are supported in their work to innovate and experiment around curriculum and the academic content of the degree. The goal addresses both master's and doctoral education it embraces interdisciplinarity and research-based innovation in graduate education. Our second goal is strengthen diversity. In this goal, Rackham students from different backgrounds, with different life experiences, and different distances traveled to arrive here at the University of Michigan, all experience a sense of belonging and inclusion in their programs. Rackham's programs are increasingly diverse because of our community's intense commitment to DEI. This goal addresses what's needed for Rackham's diverse population of students to thrive within their programs. Our third goal is enhance partnerships and community, in which all members of the Rackham community, students, faculty, staff, and alumni are welcomed into this work. And our fourth goal is strengthen organizational culture and climate, in which Rackham itself examines ways to improve its capacity to support the work of rethinking graduate education. So some of the efforts that have grown out of our planning in the last year are launching now. I'd like to take a moment just to describe those to you. The first are a set of uh, m cubed diamond projects. We held a symposium in May about research-based innovation in graduate education. Um, as a result of that, uh, we stood up a call for m cubed uh, diamond projects, which are fully supported by Rackham to engage in research-based innovation in graduate education. We've just funded the first four proposals within that call. This will be, uh, the, the aim of this work will be to to uh, augment curriculum and academic experience from research-based ideas in both, for both master's and doctoral students. A second project that's launching now is our Graduate Student Mental Health Task Force. This is a, a project that is comprised, the team is comprised of graduate faculty, graduate students, and mental health professionals. It's led by Dr. Megan Duffy from Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And its goal is to, uh, for this team to develop actionable ideas uh, that can be used to support graduate students in their mental health and their academic progress as they undergo, um, as, as they undergo their degrees. Our third uh, um, uh, initiative that is launching now is a review of the Rackham Merit Fellowship Program. Many of you will be aware of the RMF program. It is our most, is it our premier recruiting fellowship. It has materially affected the diversity of the Rackham student population. It's been a program that has uh, been successful for 20 years. We think it's an opportune time now to review this program and align its goals with our current efforts and interests and needs in DEI so that it's stood up now for success for the next 20 years. 
So as a final piece, I just want to take a moment to ask something of you. So just by being here today, you've demonstrated your interest in, uh, and your curiosity about reimagining graduate education and your possibly and hopefully your appreciation of its importance. We want to give the whole Rackham community, students, staff, alumni, and faculty, a number of different opportunities to engage on, on this as we move forward. For this work to succeed, we really need your ideas. We need your commitment. We need you to be talking with your, with your colleagues about what is possible, what might be done. We need you, and we need people to be champions within programs to help make this a reality. For the faculty of the audience, I would like to speak to you directly for just a moment. I'll be hosting monthly coffee hours during which we can talk about ideas that are related to this vision. I would also like to ask faculty to gear up with their ideas to support some calls for initiatives that we'll be launching a little bit later in the year associated with events that I'll, I'll talk about in just a moment. And as a last piece, um, our Rackham Associate Deans and myself, we're available to join you at a faculty meeting if you'd like to talk about some of these broader issues with your colleagues. So as a final, uh, as a, as a final ask, if you like or request, I want to invite you to participate in a national symposium we'll be hosting on rethinking graduate education on February 7th. We'll be bringing together national leaders to help us have both a cross-disciplinary and an interdisciplinary conversation to catalyze new ideas. And Rackham is ready and prepared to invest in those ideas that are generated as a result of those symposium. So today, I hope that I've given you an overview of some of the ways that we can rethink graduate education for the 21st century. My hope in presenting these ideas and initiatives to you is to draw your attention to the exciting ways that graduate training is already changing on our campus and to offer examples that you might learn from as you think about what might make sense within your disciplines and fields going forward. I just want to conclude by stressing that this vision, I think, requires all of us to come together as a group. It requires graduate faculty, graduate students, graduate staff, and alumni all to come together to really kind of embrace and work together on this vision around student-centered graduate education. The University of Michigan really is the unique place, just a well-positioned a well place to engage this work. And Rackham is poised, poised and ready to help you um, as you embrace this work going forward. So with that, I want to thank you. And, uh, and then uh, we'll have time for questions and discussion. Thank you very much. I'm not 100% sure how we're doing this, but I think there are microphones and there are people with questions, and so we will be doing, yeah, okay, we, we have a way to, so if you can uh, signal, uh, indicate in some way, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get going from there. We have, we have one right there. Please go ahead, Julie. And then we have uh, Nils here and Mark as well. Julie, please go ahead. As you know, I'm excited about a great deal of this, all of it, actually. Um, I would say that two themes, through lines, um, uh, priorities, um, I think could need to be lifted up and uh, in concrete ways. And, and that is there are scores, hundreds of national leaders around these questions who are graduate students, recent graduate students, early career people, who um, are publishing on these issues collaboratively um, in, uh, in, in books and articles. Um, they are um, writing about, for example, having um, thinking about the hybridity of their, of their professional aspirations and trying to figure out how, uh, what a position is like, and they're telling us what that feels like, and they are program built, they're program builders where they are. And I, I think that, um, you know, nothing about us without us uh, you know, might very well apply under that category of national leaders, and in Canada as well, there, there, there are some very important um, people who are in conversation across the border, so, and one could, ripples beyond that, but, so I think that's important. I also think opening up explicitly the question of faculty learning, uh, faculty learning, yes, from and with graduate students, but, you know, just, just um, uh, faculty learning about um, uh, experiments elsewhere, what, what, what we're doing, 
you know, so coffee hours are great, you know, but really explicitly uh, talking about um, uh, how diversity allies operates, does it operate as a lever for departmental changes of various, or does it uh, work as a feedback loop to Rackham, and how does that work? I mean, I, I think that faculty learning um, is as important as graduate student learning. I think, let me, and uh, those are both, and to speak briefly about them in the reverse order, you know, when you think about what this building was, was built for, Rackham's, uh, they, they wanted this to be a center of interdisciplinary exchange, and an event like this, the event we had in May, these are examples of this. So this idea about faculty learning, you know, and for us that means getting together and talking across, across disciplines. There's so much, I think, to be learned uh, in, in these ways, and we can, we're, 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 Rackham is available to kind of catalyze and coordinate these kinds of activities. And the other piece about um, engaging our own alumni, I think, is, very, is, is really right on point. I, wanted, um, I just had the opportunity to attend uh, an event in Detroit uh, last year called Rackham Impact in Detroit, which we heard from recent alumni and our own graduate students about the work um, in Detroit that they're doing that really engages in the sphere of public scholarship and public engagement. And just to kind of connect the two together, I learned so much about what those, what those students are doing. And that's just one example of the wonderful work that, that our students are doing that we can learn from. Yeah, thank you, George. Nils. Yeah, maybe um, this is a great segue into the question I had. So um, I, I, I think um, Breckham is really pioneering this, and this is an important role to play nationwide. But coming from a different educational system myself, I also see this challenge of there not being the same pact, societal pact between higher education and society at large in terms of understanding what role society really plays, I mean, uh, higher education really plays in bringing us the drugs and technologies of the future. Um, and that's something that is uh, not, dif not easy to convey to the public. Rackham's role, of course, is mostly inward-looking, and the program is mostly inward-looking, which makes a lot of sense because that's the role that Rackham has. But I'm just wondering whether there are other ways in kind of engaging the broader public beyond Michigan in some way. I mean, you do that maybe with this conference already and things like this, but are there other ways in which um, Rackham can um, kind of go to Washington and do something, right? Or, I mean, or, or to Lansing and, and engage broader swath. Okay, that's a great, so the, 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 I mean, this is a wonderful question for everybody in higher education to be thinking of at the current moment. And it's really one of the pressures, I think, that I identified. One thing I would say is that um, I've thought that, uh, so it's, it's an it's a important thing to think about, and one of the ways that I've thought about this is that our best advocates are our students, and one of the ways that I've seen this happen is through SAGE, which is a, it's an organization of students that really take this on to go, so the G is for graduate, so they themselves go to Lansing, they go to Washington, and they talk about the work that they're doing. And I think what the connection is, I think the thing that the public doesn't always understand is how these research discoveries that affect their lives are actually happening, okay? They are happening through the work that we do as graduate educators. Um, and those, you know, those discoveries are across, you know, those are, those are not just scientific discoveries, those are discoveries about how people interact and about the human condition. And so I think there is a, there is a piece of work to be, to be done there. In some sense, I think through this innovation that we're engaging in here, that will give us, that will give us the way to talk about this in a way that, that you know, is one step on, on, on that path. Thanks, Nils. Mark? So just talking about the inward facing and thinking about a lot of research now is interdisciplinary. And that's, I think, great for the students, great for the faculty. And the one thing I'd like you to comment on or that I worry about is how do you generate or how do you take the knowledge that's generated in those experience, experiences and sort of funnel that back to the curriculum? And I think that the structure that we live in could arguably hinder that and whether you see the future as more certificate programs, or, or what are your thoughts on that? So the, um, so I think the, the question is a, is, a, is, a, is a wonderful one. And when I'm out talking about needs, you know, trying to learn from faculty and students about where the needs are, I often hear the words barriers to interdisciplinary. So the word barrier often comes up within this context. And so there is this, you know, interdisciplinary work, of course, at its root relies on strong disciplines. And then there's the idea that, as I under, you know, my model of this is that disciplines regenerate and grow through these kinds of exchanges. 
And so well, I think we're perhaps a in some ways we're a little bit at the start in this in that um, there are, I think one can identify barriers to interdisciplinary and I wouldn't want to um, kind of precondition uh, what, what those barriers actually are. Um, you can see, if you look at what the data show, there's been a tremendous growth and in interest in certificate programs. Um, and so that is one, certainly one way and one that we seek to support both at, in, a, in as many ways as that we can. But I do, I would ask this community the question, is that the only way that interdisciplinarity can occur? I'm gonna go back to my own example just for a moment. If I'd had some boot camp that I could have gone to to get that, that thing that was, that, I, that, that experience with a faculty member that I couldn't find as a student, that might have, that might have put me on a, on, a, on, a, on a different path. So what would it look like to have if, if a complementary skill would, would, would energize a student's research and actually help the discipline itself, you know, what would it look like for that actually to happen? Is there, a, you, there's a mi microphone up here and then we'll, we'll come back to you. Right. Uh, there you are, yep, thank you. Um, one of the things that in my department we don't have a very good ability to address is when students come up to us and say, well, we're thinking of leaving the field. What are the opportunities and can you help us get into that? Uh, we're very good at directing them to the field and people we know, but when they want to move into industry and other things, it's uh, a real challenge for us and I imagine other departments as well that seems like one of these centralized things that Rackham might be able to approach. Yes, I think it's a, uh, thanks, for, thanks for asking that uh, question because I think this is a, this is something that I think is a common across many, many disciplines, is how, how do you actually make that jump? You wanna help your students, but how do you get them the information? So what we've learned um, in our conversation with programs, th through program review, in fact, that there are a number of ways to kind of catalyze this, this kind of jump to support students into other careers. Internships often are one of them, and often the other piece is inviting your own alumni back, like finding, you know, because we're so good about knowing where our alumni are within Rackham, you know, through your, through your work, we often can identify alumni and then we would, and some programs will invite them back actually to kind of, so you can actually directly ask those questions. What I think is most strong is when those alumni, when they come back, they don't just talk to students, right? So students wanna hear from those alumni about what happened, but what really is a value is when those alumni come back and they talk to faculty, right? Faculty, like I, I would use myself as an example, um, I, uh, in an earlier period, did not really know how to help students find industry careers. But when my students that got those jobs came back and talked to me, I asked them about what it was about their experience that helped them. And then over time, I've gained some fluency with that. So that may not be the, I don't wanna say that that's the only answer, but I would say that Rackham is, a, is can do what you said, which is have this set of resources available. And what works, you know, what worked for me may not work for you in astronomy, and it may not work for, for you in comp lit, et cetera. And that, that's something that we can definitely address. Does that answer your question, or do you want to ask a follow-up? Mm -hmm. Former grads come in, there's a life after graduate school, but they really need to be able to go to a professional person who will tell them what companies are looking for and not looking for, and who really understand that in some depth, that a depth that even though I try, I don't understand. So it would be better to have some central facility or, or Yep, understood. And that's really helpful. So one thing I'm just gonna give a shout out to Laura Schramm at Rackham and our PhD Career Connections Conference, which sounds more like what you're saying, where we have a, a campus event where students can would come explore their interest and then we have thematic uh, sessions that are held based on different kinds of career tracks and then students can explore the connections of those. So that's another way to do that as well. And maybe there's things that we still need to learn and, and develop. Yes, thank you. I'm a PhD student in health behavior, health education. Um, so I appreciate the need to reimagine the academy. <laughs> um, I am sitting with attention to something that you said a little bit earlier, where you said graduate education should be student-centered, and at the same time that the changes need to be faculty-led. And I can't help but sit and wonder why we would exclude students from leading efforts to change our own education um, and put this on faculty, which I respect 
their expertise and also recognizing that they've also been trained at a time that might be 40, 50 years before we're here today. And so, <laughs> no offense, I mean, but it's also the truth. So we have to like sit with the fact that like some of the things we're learning are old, like to be completely frank. And so how do we as an academy and those who are training up the next researchers and leaders in our fields get to insert our needs into what curricula and teaching looks like? So I, I appreciate your, I appreciate the comment and I think you are getting at like I would like to try to hold uh, our, our view, the collective view that we've come to the year is that we're trying to hold these two ideas together at once. That students are contributing to this effort, that the ways that you describe uh, are, are uh, engaged. And at the same time, the faculty who, who are collaborating with the students on the research and scholarship um, are, are also are, are engaged in this process in a way that it has a leadership role given the way in which they create, uh, they, they have the role of creating curriculum on campus. So I really, I really do appreciate your point and I think you're getting at the f fundamental idea of student-centered and this idea, and, and I would say, you know, the way you've spoken about this, these are conversations we've had at, at great length within Rackham. How do these two ideas fit together? And I do believe that they fit together that we want faculty to be engaged in this work in a deep level uh, because that is, their, that is their role. And at the same time, we want students, I mean, this would really go to Julie's point, is we want students who themselves have expertise in this area, so often through their own scholarship, to be able to contribute as well. And that is some of the work, to be frank, that we need to do and probably needs to be done within programs. Thank you. Uh, let's see, is there, I think we've got mics going, Ron. You can get your... And then we have. I have. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, so you made um, a brief mention in your talk about the way faculty are stretched, um, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how to um, shift some of that stretch so that more faculty can be more deeply engaged in really working on these issues. So I, I mean, I think many of us are deeply committed to the things that you have outlined, um, but. We're stretched, <laughs> and and you know, I mean, there are similar pressures coming from the undergraduate curriculum, from faculty governance, um, and and I'm just curious. I, I haven't seen very many models that um, explore the ways in which we could shift what faculty workloads look like um, to accommodate some of this. And I'm just curious if you have thought about that and what that might look like from your perspective. Uh, so I don't, uh, I won't be able to give you an answer. So I would say is, uh, I've thought about it. I would say that I've. Maybe I would just replace the word thought with, with worried about it. And, uh, and if I were to look forward three years from now, three, four years from now, and, w and wonder like what, what was the central tension that we were trying to, trying to work with here, I would put that as two or three things on the list. And I think it's, you said it very well. It's faculty want to do this work, and how can we create a space to do that? And that's really at its root why when you had that tagline there, that's why Rackham supported it is there. So, you know, we have a goal looking around how can we actually do this. Uh, we would like, we will not be able to completely solve this problem, but I think where we are at the stage is identifying this, is that this is one of the constraints. This is the one of the things we need to address to get this, to, to, for this to move forward. And so I can't give you a full answer than that, but I accept to say that I think there is, it is progress already to kind of call that out and say that we need to be thinking about it as part of this work. Let's see, we've, um, there's a hand here, and there's, a, there's a, been a hand here, and then you have the microphone. So. Yes, hi. Yes. So I wanna change the conversation a little bit because there's been tremendous pressure to start offering courses over the internet and graduate education over the internet. And I have been struck by the fact that our remedies here are the ones that I support, which is more person-to-person -person communication, more time with students, more outreach, networking, and so forth, which the internet is not, um, really an optimum venue for it. And in fact, I, when I look at graduate education through mass uh, dissemination, the things that I think are essential to graduate education, uh, an opportunity to wrestle with information with other individuals and, and have discussed them deeply and argue over them is lost. And so, yet there's economic incentives, strong economic incentives for the academia 
to offer these programs. So how are we wrestling with that in Rackham? So you, you identified, um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Rackham just for a second, which is that we have an elected executive board. It's 12 uh, kind faculty members who uh, serve uh, um, basically as your representatives as graduate faculty. One of the things I'll be asking them to do this year is to constitute themselves as a learning community to really dive into this question. So we can see, and it's not just nationally, I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, for those of you in some of the professional schools, there are online programs that are being stood up here at the moment at the University of Michigan. I think the question for us as research, people that kind of specialize or are thinking about research-based education is, what, can, what are there things that we can take from those models? The experiment, you know, whenever we talk about, we talk about experience, we talk about a close relationship with faculty and students, but are there pieces I imagine it would always be some kind of hybrid approach, but are there pieces where there would be value? I do go back sometimes to this times where there's a particular skill that a student might want to value that might be useful to gain outside of a course context, and perhaps there's an opportunity there. But I do, I do think that this, this tension is one reason why, why you, we see not too, many move, too much movement in this space into this area, but at the same time, if there is an opportunity there, I would like us to be able to identify it. And it's one reason why, like in the goals of this plan, we have this idea to talk about you know, modes of delivery, and then at the, but at the same time acknowledging this deep kind of experiential component is, is deeply intrinsic to what we do. It's a great point. Okay, uh, in the back, I don't know if you guys can get your hands on a microphone here. There's some people here that are interested in the microphone. Oh, you have one, good, okay. Uh, please go ahead, thank you. So I wanted to bring the conversation back to the interdisciplinary aspect. And so one thing we, you talked about here is inter listener, uh, interdisciplinary exchange between different departments, right? You talked about going to another lab to learn another technique or discussing amongst other departments. But when we talk about interdisciplinary exchange, we still kind of remain in this sort of traditional narrow scope like I am in my discipline, and I, maybe I learn a little bit from another discipline, but I'm still anchored in this one discipline. And so, considering that, I wonder, do you have any plans going forward considering the idea of more interdisciplinary learning, a kind of program or um, anything like that, where students learn between different disciplines? They're not anchored in one traditional, like, literature or Asian studies or whatever. They're kind of not really anchored specifically in any one spot and learning from a multitude of disciplines to create a sort of comprehensive kind of degree certificate. And I was just wondering what you think about this kind of thing, the limitations of exchange versus learning. This is, uh, this is a very interesting point and one where I think the understanding of this varies a lot by where we are within the graduate school. So I would mention that there's a couple programs that I could think of that are maybe a little bit more on the STEM side where they're interdisciplinary in the sense that um, those fields actually in an earlier phase did, did not exist and they became graduate programs uh, that in some sense are not actually linked to an undergraduate degree. So they're, they're, I'm thinking of programs like applied physics um, or the macromolecular science and engineering program where if you look at the curriculum in those programs, they actually draw, to use macro as an example, they draw from chemistry, they draw from engineering, they draw from physics. And so these, these programs were stood up, and they can be stood up, and there have been programs that have been stood up even within the last five years that are really designed to kind of capitalize on kind of some, you know, intersection of a set of fields that are, that are uh, kind of proximate to each other and then create something new, truly new that goes forward. And so I mentioned that just to say that that can and does happen. Um, and what I, what I do find a little bit interesting is that the extent to which we see that does vary a little bit by, by by fields, and so that's an example I think we're cross-disciplinary, like we're, we're, you know, we're humanists and physical scientists. There are things that we all can learn from each other just by talking in this kind of educative way about what what it is that we're actually doing. So I think you've raised a great point. I'm a PhD student, and uh, you're talking about rethinking graduate education. Uh, there's I've been, I worked in industry for a number of years before I came back to graduate school, and, I've, and I see that there's a lot of things I learned in, in industry that are kind of, nobody in, in the academic environment even knows that those things are out there. 
and, and I've heard several comments already, including your own story about faculty having a hard time understanding what's going on in industry. Well, I know there are engineering programs where part of getting a bachelor's degree or maybe even a graduate degree of some sort is to spend time in industry. Why couldn't something like that apply to faculty as well? Suppose, I mean, this is a wild idea, <laughs> but suppose it's something that was either encouraged or maybe even required to obtain tenure or maybe even to maintain tenure was to spend a certain amount, maybe one or two years out of every decade in some other environment, in industry or some environment outside of ac academia where there could be some, both the, the faculty member could contribute to that, whatever that environment is, and then bring back into the academy a uh, new experience that they wouldn't have gotten any other way. I, I did think that rethinking graduate education was going to be kind of tough, but I think you kind of touched on everything in, in there. That was a, I'm not sure I can actually really, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pick that one up. Um, but, your, but your broad point is appreciated about, you know, there's, there's, you know, when we think about internships, right, there's this interest in students kind of connecting into, into different fields. And what would it look like for faculty to have the ability to do that as well? So I would kind of scale back. And I think, you know, there, and again, I think that varies across discipline, how prevalent those interactions are and how you go about seeing, uh, how about you, you go about actually receiving them. Um, I'm not going to go with the tenure and the things like that. That's for somewhat else. But I, I thank you for your question. I think we're, I just want to do a time show. Yes. So I'm going to take a last question. I'm happy to, and it's going to be up there with the gentleman with the microphone. Um, and then um, I'll be happy to, I'll be at the poster session as well, and, and please, we'll be able to uh, continue this, because I do want to give, we have colleagues that are going to be uh, ha having posters, and, uh, and so we'll take that question, and then I'll close out. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, two quick things. One, in response to your interdisciplinariness, a specific thing I would recommend looking at is SIDP, the Student Initiated Degree Program, which, if you don't know, allows to... PhD programs to be combined, and uh, I guess two aspects. One is uh, you can a student can only do it once they arrive, so you cannot use it as a recruitment tool. You can mention it, but uh, that raises a challenge. And also, um, there are there are funding and other bureaucratic issues we hit when you're negotiating with other programs. And if there's ways that Rackham could facilitate that or help us, that'd be great. I guess the the bigger challenge I see in graduate education coming from a public serving, public minded professional school is we are at a public institution with quasi private tuition, which our graduate students feel. Um, we are training students to serve the public interest and believe in the public good, but they are entering a labor force and a political economy where increasingly the rhetoric about the university is moving away from public goods and, and education as a private good. Now those tensions between public and private can be exciting, but I think those tensions are getting to a breaking point, at least in us smaller fields like urban planning, et cetera, and at some point, something's gonna break. That is a great way to round out this session. <laughs> that was it. Um, I mean, you've identified, like you've kind of taken some of the pressures that I talked about and kind of like extrapolated them, I think, five or, five or 10 years out. Um, and I think this conflict, you know, this, this, your, how you kind of put together public and private good is a really interesting thing that I think we keep, that we do well to keep in mind. And I think I would then come back to when you look at the University of Michigan's mission, when you look at Rackham's mission, we've got public good right there. And I think, you know, it's why I don't, you know, we all have made choices as to where we are, but I'm at the University of Michigan because of that piece with the public good and how to reconcile that with the broader public interest is something that we have, we have to do. I just want to compliment you on uh, knowing about a student-initiated degree program. That's the, uh, just so you all know about that, that's, uh, there's about 100 students or so that, you know, on a five-year scale are doing PhDs that are really collaborations between two departments where the student initiates a degree program. So it's a, it's a jewel of, of that uh, we have at the University of Michigan that's really uh, results because of this kind of common structure that we have at the Rackham Graduate School. The PhD research-based masters are common degrees across the University of Michigan, and they have common, common goals, common principles, and that's really why, in its essence, we have a graduate school. 
So with that, I really want to thank you for this has been a wonderful conversation. I understand that we're going to be able to open up the doors. So don't go out there right away so you can go out onto the veranda and look out. Please do spend some time with the posters, but it's a wonderful day out. So please enjoy yourselves and continue additional conversation. And thank you so much. Thank you.